Are we good? We are ready to start. Very good. Good evening. I'll call to order the special council meeting of August 19th. Before we get started, I'd like to remind council and participants of some procedural items for tonight's meeting. During the meeting, council members and participants will remain muted when not speaking. If participants have a question or a comment, please use the raise your hand feature. Speakers will be called upon one at a time. This, this city council meeting is being conducted using teleconferencing and electronic means consistent with State of California Executive Order N-29-20 regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. Members of the public may provide audio public comment by connecting to the teleconference meeting online or by telephone. Use the raise your hand feature to request to speak star nine on the telephone. Teleconference meeting details are available on the council agenda. Comments on the study session uh, must be submitted prior to the time the mayor closes public comment on the item. First up is roll call. Deputy City Clerk, may we have, have the roll call, please? Mayor Klein? Present. Vice Mayor Smith? Present. Council Member Larson? Present. Council Member Hendricks? Attending. Council Member Melton? Present. Council Member Goldman? Council Member Goldman? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, present. Thank you. Council Member Huang. Present. Seven present, participating via teleconference. Thank you. Uh, next is public comment. Since we remain in a virtual setting, I will ask the public to use the virtual raise your hand button or dial star nine on your telephone to indicate that they wish to comment uh, tonight. Speakers are requested to keep their comments to no more than two minutes and time limits will be strictly enforced. Deputy City Clerk will ask you to unmute your microphone when it's your turn to address the council. Deputy City Clerk, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? No, Mr. Mayor, no one has raised their hand indicating a desire to speak on an agenda item. Great. So next we'll move to item 20-0010, board and commission interviews. Tonight, council will be interviewing nine candidates. Uh, to be fair, council members will be asked to at, allowed to ask questions in revolving order based initially on seniority. So Vice Mayor Smith, Council Member Larson, Council Member Hendricks, Melton, Goldman, and Fong. Uh, moving forward, uh, Deputy City Clerk, are we ready for our first candidate? I think she was muted. Ah, okay. Thank you, Council Member Hendricks. <laughs> Council members, your first candidate, Omar Dean, has just been promoted to panelist. Thank you. Welcome, Omar. Uh, I'll take a moment to explain the process. Each council member will have an opportunity to ask you a question. Uh, the interview is scheduled for 15 minutes, so please keep this in mind when you're answering questions. Uh, with that, let's go on to questions. Uh, first up is Vice Mayor Smith. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Omar, for applying. In looking at your uh, application, I see that um, that you um, had some ideas for a below um, a below market rate uh, move-in loan program. So I was uh, wondering if you could tell us more about where you got the idea and if you know of other cities using CDBG monies to um, to implement such a program. Yeah. Okay. And can you hear me? Okay. Perfect. Well, first of all, thank you so much to all of council for interviewing me and giving me the space to talk about these issues and why I want to be on the commission. Uh, and thank you for the question. I think to jump into it, yeah, I um, actually, it was an idea that I'm interested in exploring. I will say it's definitely somewhat of a rough idea. So part of the reason I put it on there is because I would like to explore it further and suggest it and do an in-depth study on it and actually see where the pros are, what the benefits are um, and where the actual funding could come from. Uh, but that being said, I got the idea from some actual research I was doing earlier of seeing policy proposals done by nonprofit think tanks and nonprofit uh, groups that work on the housing area, 
I don't actually know any specific cities that have tried to implement it off the top of my head, but I will definitely look into it and try and get back to you if I have that opportunity. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know of any actual cities I've used it or use CDBG, but I do think that that could be a source of funding for it. Um, and part of the inspiration also comes from the move-in loan program that the city does um, and wondering how we could use those sort of techniques to apply to our renter population. Because I think, right, Sunnyvale and especially the area of Sunnyvale that I live in, Northern Sunnyvale has a huge renter population. So I want to make sure that the city is also doing stuff for them and the supporting them in those efforts. Okay, thank you. That was all I had. So um, moving on to the next person. Thank you, Councilmember Larson. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Omar, for being here and applying for a commission. So uh, you had served uh, on the Parks and Rec uh, Commission a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could tell us more about your experience, what you learned about the role of a commissioner um, and how, you, how that would inform you serving on another commission. Yeah, definitely. Um, actually, I'm really glad you asked about that because I'm lucky it gives me a platform to talk about it. Uh, but I applied to Parks and Rec when I actually first became eligible to do it when I was 18, um, literally a few months afterward because, right, you're not allowed to if you can't vote. Uh, but I applied because I knew that I wanted to learn as much as I could. So while I was on the commission, that was my focus, it's learning. And the big things I learned about were first and foremost about funding decisions, how they're made, how the city's budget is actually influenced by commissions and the way that they can, um, you know, get some oversight and input into the decisions. That was a big one. The other one were also sort of the nuts and bolts of just parliamentary procedure, what the interface between council and commissions looks like, how you can actually communicate with council and council members. And then the other big thing I learned is how to actually think critically when these things are in front of you. You know, a lot of the issues that came before me while I was on Parks and Rec were things I had never been exposed to before or thought about before because I was still in my first year of college. And so learning that literacy of how to look at policy issues, how to look at budget issues and monetary issues when you might not have the background for it yet was something that I think I really benefited from and something that I gained out of my time on the commission that I think will definitely help me on this commission as well. Because even though since then I've gained a lot of experience in public policy and in my studies, there are some things that I'm sure are gonna come up that I haven't heard about before. So knowing that I'm prepared to, you know, how to get the agenda early, how to look through it, how to read it, and then how to actually research these issues before the meeting so I can come prepared to talk about it intelligently. Great, thank you. So thank I think you. I'm up next. Um, so Omar, um, thanks for your prior uh, service to the city. Thanks for applying again. And I don't have any questions. Okay. And then uh, next Omar, up is Council Member Melton. Thanks. I'll just grab the steering wheel here. Omar, nice to see you. Thank you for applying. Tell me the highlights of your work as a financial analyst. I think the company's name is pronounced Asana. Yeah. Uh, tell me more about that, please. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I worked, I interned with Asana while I was still in college. And after I graduated, I was lucky enough to be hired back by them. Uh, and I worked while I was there, it was still a very like mid-stage startup. So the finance team from the CFO down to me as an intern was only five or six people. So as a result, the exposure was huge. You know, I think with startups and um, with startups, the thing is that you have a lot of problems that come up that are the first time the company's ever faced it or they're problems that they might not have the bandwidth to handle. So they give a lot of it to you as an intern, even if it might be something you'd only give to someone with three, four or five years of experience. So I learned a lot about financial literacy, about financial an analysis, about actual operations. A lot of the work that I ended up doing, especially during my internship and then when I was hired back, related to actual operations on the day-to-day -day of how the company is run. Uh, so I learned a lot through that. And then I was lucky enough that when I got hired back, and I didn't even know this until my first day, Asana in the interim, while I was at, still at college, had began the process of its S1 filing. And for those of you who are familiar, the S1 is sort of the first step that a company takes as it goes into um, you know, a process of being put on the market. Uh, it's weird because I'm allowed to talk about some parts, but legally off, like prohibited from talking about other parts. So I, because the S1 already occurred, I can talk about that. Uh, but it taught me a lot about how to look through all of a company's documents. We did a full scale audit of the company before doing that. Um, and then how to, you know, there are just so many unique skills tied into it, of just like accounts payable, of, you know, the day-to-day -day operations um, and things like that, that I learned from it. 
sorry, I have to stay vague because it's so strange the things I'm not allowed to talk about and there's a lot of legality around it. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Councilmember Goldman. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Mayor Klein. Uh, hi, Mr. Din. Uh, thank you very much for applying. Um, I did, um, you know, it's interesting uh, looking over, uh, there's a big debate going on. Uh, it, there's a housing shortage, which uh, some would say, not everyone, mm -hmm. uh, and therefore we should build more housing. But as we build more housing, we find that it's, it's in fact uh, forcing out of town uh, the people at the lower end of the economic spectrum. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so, so how, do we re how do we resolve that? Because, um, you know, uh, the idea of building more housing will lower the rents doesn't seem to be working. So what is your approach to the issue? Hmm. Okay, well, thank you for that question and thank you for your insights on it. Um, I think for me, it's twofold. So one thing that I do wanna look at and prioritize is that sort of housing to jobs ratio because as we have increases in job growth in the area, especially with a lot of the new developments that are coming for companies like Google, um, making sure that we have housing to match that to the library, right? because more people will just be coming, wanting to come closer to where they work. And then on the other side, like you said, making sure people don't actually get pushed out and that we don't have that negative externality. I think it's important that the city has protections for people, such as what I mentioned, um, wanting to explore into a move in loan program for renters, right? So that if people, you know, maybe the apartment they're in right now becomes too expensive, but they want to stay in Sunnyvale, having programs there to assist them in remaining in Sunnyvale. Sorry, I can't hear you. Anything out, Mike? Yeah, sure, muted, Mike. Uh, thank you, I'm done. Okay, Council Member Fong. Yes, hi, Omar, thanks for uh, flying and for your past service. Um, I noticed on your question about uh, attending a previous council meeting, you, know, you noted the things you learned during a council meeting. Have you attended a previous housing commission meeting or if not attended, have you watched the meeting and what, what did you take away from that? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I will say this, so I wanted to attend some of the housing commission meetings recently, uh, but unfortunately, I think all the commission meetings since, I forget which month, February or March, has been canceled, so I wasn't able to, although I did want to for the past few months. But I did go back and view the previous ones, especially from last year, as, um, and you know, I viewed them, watched them, because I wanted to you know, actually learn about the commission, what it's like and what my takeaways would be. And some of the big, one of the main things that really stuck out to me that I appreciated was at one of the commission meetings, I think it was the one where they were actually discussing their study issue propositions for the coming year. They were talking about a specific issue related to land use with uh, the water district. And one of the, I think it was either the staff or commission members mentioned how they had actually talked with a resident that was being affected by that issue. And the resident had, you know, had had issues in the past with people using the land and using it to do illegal and illicit activities related to drugs and how that was an issue with them. And they wanted to talk to the city, but because it was owned by the water district, that was an issue. And they actually used that to inform the decisions that they were making. And it really highlighted for me the real world effects that this has. I think it's easy sometimes to look at these issues and just see them as numbers or just see them as, um, right, like making one decision or two decisions in the immediate and not consider the effects long term and how those effects should change your decision. And so I found that as a really good way of keeping the commission grounded and keeping everyone involved grounded in the actual real world implications of their policy decisions. Thank you. Thank you. And, and so you talked about, Omar, you talked about uh, some of the meetings that you watched. Did you actually watch the meeting uh, that the Housing and Human Services Commission gives recommendations to council on CDBG funding? Because that to me, I think is one of the critical items as far as recommendations that they give to us. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't think I watched that specific one. Okay. But I will watch it in the future now. <laughs> it's, uh, if I am lucky enough and you know, if you are gracious enough to allow me to be on the commission, I will definitely watch those now that I have that advice. And you mentioned the CDBG funds. Did, so do you have a good understanding of how they're allocated and what, what the process is as far as? Yeah. So uh, from my understanding, it's funds that come from the federal government uh, through, the, through HUD that are given to the city and the city is able to allocate it out to support housing creation and then also to support people's housing needs in the area in general. 
Um, and the way that I, I think my understanding is the commission makes recommendations from that on how it should actually be allocated, then those recommendations go to council for approval. Okay, good. Okay, uh, Omar, uh, thank you for your interest. A final decision will be made uh, on August 25th and uh, from by, by city council and the city clerk will then contact you after that meeting to inform you of the outcome. So thanks for, for joining us this evening. Thanks for applying. Thank you so much. And thank you again to all of council for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Great, thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Uh, Deputy city clerk, are we ready with our next candidate? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Your next candidate, Franklin Lowe, has just been promoted to a panelist. Hello, Franklin. Uh, Hello, I'll Mayor take Clint, how are you? Good, very good, hope you're safe. Uh, let me take a moment to explain the process. So each council member will have an opportunity to speak and ask you a question. Uh, the interview is scheduled to last for 15 minutes, so please keep this in mind when you're answering those questions. Uh, first up, with questions is Councilmember Larson. Hello, Franklin. Thank you for applying and it's nice to meet you even if it's uh, virtually. Um, yes. Hopefully one day we can meet in person. Um, I so, so. I, no I noticed in your application a couple times you talked about human rights and I was hoping you could elaborate a little more on what you, were, um, what you meant by that and how that would inform your decision-making as a Housing and Human Services Commissioner. Yeah, so for me, uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and um, for me, growing up uh, from the East Coast and moving to California, and even just watching things take place in current media, um, there's a lot of things going on in regards to human rights. Um, people are, of all backgrounds, are coming together to fight for a common goal of equality and want to make sure all people are viewed in the same, in the same light. So for me, that's something I've always been extremely passionate about. While in college, I was on the Caribbean Student Organization, part of the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineer Organization. And one of the key things I wanted to do was always reach out to people within the different communities and understand how their voices can be better heard and work with them in order to help elevate themselves and also training them in different tools that they can utilize and educating them in different systems and programs that are available to them. Good, thank you. Um, appreciate the, uh, the answer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Hendricks. Yeah, hello, um, Franklin, great to um, meet you here. Hello. Um, thanks for applying. In your answers, you talked about, um, you were talking about some of the programs and being, needing to educate people more and um, being able to try and make things more well known. Do you have um, thoughts of what, you know, you could bring to the commission to make recommendations to improve that? Yes, so currently I work as a marketing consultant and I've worked with companies of all sizes. So in the past, I've been able to take small companies and help them become more popular in household names. And for me, I know there's a lot of housing programs like the BMR program and also some other things that include financing via HUD um, and other items. So for me, one of the things I would like to do is take on some initiatives that I read through in some of the study documents or some of the... Um, previous meeting documents where marketing some of the programs would be an issue. So I would like to get on the ground level to work with you guys in publicizing these programs more. If that means even dealing with this COVID crisis, if that means going out to different venues and um, hosting something or talking with people, obviously at a social distance stand, uh, from social distance uh, standpoint and educating them about these things, that's what I'm willing to do. I just want to make sure that Sunnyvale stays the really, really powerful and diverse community that it is. Cool. Thanks a lot. No problem. Thank you. Councilmember Melton. Hey, Franklin. I'm Russ. It's nice to Hello. meet you over Zoom. Pleasure is mine. And uh, thank you for applying to serve on the Housing and Human Services Commission. I really appreciate it. Um, when we talk about housing and human services, a lot of time housing is what folks talk the most about, but tell me what human services means to you. So for me, human services, I also work in healthcare right now. So for me, we always combine like HHS, health and human services. And, um, you know, in a sense, people feel it's anonymous. But for me, what I really want to do as far as the human service component is 
try to find out more about what's ailing people, what's on people's mind, and kind of address those issues. Um, that could be inclusive of housing as well. I know Sunnyvale, obviously everywhere in California has homeless people, um, but I know Sunnyvale has homeless people. We have people who can't afford housing. And that also ties into, you know, the rights of people to, the, the inherited rights in a sense, where they feel that they should be able to afford housing. They should be able to uh, live a certain kind of lifestyle. So address things at the ground level, the human level, human interaction, understand them much better. And then figure out how we can shift that into better helping them acquire better housing and um, be in a place where they feel more comfortable within themselves. Great, thank you very much. No problem. Thank you, Council Member Goldman. Hi, Frank, Mr. Lowe, thank you very much for replying. Um, Hello. Hi. Uh, so, um, the you know the the problem with housing uh, housing affordability is is kind of uh, worldwide. Um, I was looking at the government figures, and uh, those uh, having stressed um, you know, under the financial stress for housing are similar numbers for here in Brooklyn and Orlando. Mm -hmm. So, um, what could we do? Uh, it, how would we learn from these other communities? Are they doing anything different? Do you, uh, you're in marketing. Do you have any special feeling about how you could apply uh, apply uh, your skills in there? Yes, definitely. So one of the things I would like to look at is more of, um, and I think you asked a similar question to Omar. One of the things I would like to get a better understanding of is the people who have been here much longer, obviously, um, versus people who are more New to the area and understand more of the trans the transient population as well. People who come here for a few years just to work versus people who want to stay here long term. Um, and I think what we would like to do is try to find a way to even out the scale where housing is available to all of these people, no matter what their income level is. And Sunnyville has houses everywhere from where I live in Casa de Amigos, so everywhere from where I live around. $300,000 if you want to get a manufactured home all the way up to two, $3 million. So trying to find that uh, middle ground of housing and try to work with people who might not have certain requirements or might not have the requirements to live where they want to live, but maybe suggest other places that are more affordable, more within their price range. So instead of just selling houses, building relationships with folks to kind of help them attain housing. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. No uh, next up, Council Member Fong. Hi, Franklin, and thanks for applying. I hope to be able to meet you in person one day also. Um, I just have a quick question. Have you attended uh, or watched a previous Housing Commission meeting? And if so, did, what did you learn? Or have you gone through the agendas to see the topics? I have gone through the agendas, and I did notice it's a lot more housing-related topics versus uh, human service-related topics. And I have watched bits and pieces of meetings. I am not going to lie and say I've, I've watched an entire meeting. Um, but I have watched bits and pieces of meetings. I do like the structure of them. I do really appreciate the fact, and one thing I've, as you can probably tell, I'm really passionate about is people and understanding people and helping serve those people. Um, I do like how involved this commission is with the community in the sense of hearing people's thoughts and how people feel about what's going on and then addressing those issues. Um, I know there's been a few times where I've even gone to the farmer's market downtown Sunnyvale. Um, and when you guys do the events that used to take place on Wednesdays with um, the musicians and the, the street being blocked off of Murphy Street, people were out there asking questions and getting to know everyone from all the different boards and commissions. So I think for me, and what I understood in that meeting was you guys actually take stuff that you hear from people, even if it's something as a casual conversation or um, something that's uh, when you're asking for specific responses on a topic, you guys actually take that feedback and then try to implement it to understand how to work it on a macro level versus a smaller scale. Great, thank you. Thank you, uh, Omar. And so I have a quick question you know, you talk about uh, services, and I noticed you uh, were doing mentoring. Uh, can you give yes. me a little bit more information on that? Yeah, so currently I work, with, I work with three different nonprofits, one called Greenwood, 
one called College Track and one called WeLo. WeLo is We Lead Hours. Uh, College Track is to get kids all the way from middle school through college and just work with them one-on-one -on -one and mentor them and answer any questions they have and help guide them. WeLo is everywhere from elementary school up through college. Um, and, you know, I think for me, and also Greenwood is for people who are just starting out in their professional life and want to work with someone and, and get mentorship. For me, it's always really important to give back. Um, you know, I'm not one of those people who, uh, how do I say it? I wasn't always able to get to where I wanted to be professionally um, at the rate I expected or so on and so forth. I don't think anyone has always, I don't think anyone's really been able to just say, hey, I want to get there, I'm going to be there tomorrow. So for me, I like to work with people who, who really want to work hard and get to where they want to be in life, uh, professionally, personally, however that is, and help them understand, you know, there's going to be bumps in the road no matter what you do, no matter who you are, no matter what situations may come by. But it's how you respond and how you get up and how you take those bumps in the road and then move forward and move past them. Um, I also help people if they want some career guidance, like, hey, maybe you should do analytics instead of creative work. Or if you are really good with numbers, maybe you like accounting, but maybe you want to do creative stuff with numbers. So different things like that to kind of help people along their career path, their personal life, and any other way that they require any assistance. Thank you very much. Uh, Vice Mayor Smith. Yeah, Franklin, thanks so much for applying. I am glad to see your application come across. I noticed that you mentioned that you have a natural ability to lead and, and motivate. Yes. Um, so I'd love to hear some examples about, uh, <laughs> you know, some uh, times you led and motivated. Yeah, so, uh, so I work at Medicare at Blue Shield of California currently. And right now, this time period, we're setting up annual election period, AEP. And our team, or and with COVID happening at this time, team morale isn't where it usually is. So one of the things I like to do is um, I like to have a one hour meeting with my team and we just have a discussion where we just crack jokes for about 15, 20 minutes, tell funny stories that happen to each other. Um, we do meme of the week. So we'll look up different memes and share them with each other, try to make each other laugh. Um, because just because we're socially distanced doesn't mean you have to be emotionally distanced from one another. So for me, it's always making sure someone knows that someone cares on a professional side and on the personal side. Um, right now, with also with Blue Shield, there's a program called Operation Vet where we are actually doing pet and cow letters. And I'm pushing my team, hey, we should get involved with this. Um, because, you know, there's a lot of people that don't necessarily have someone to write them letters and say anything to them. So how can we, you know, make sure not only we're helping each other feel good, but also helping other people feel good? Because if I can help one person achieve something in any point of their life, even if someone wants to jump an inch high and they're jumping half an inch high, but I can help them jump that extra half, I feel like my day is much better off being able to help that person than if I just did something only for myself. Um, so for me, I just always try to make people smile, um, which makes me smile, and always try to make a person feel valued and understood. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Franklin, and, and thank you for, for your interest in this position. The final decision will be made on August 25th, uh, and the city clerk will contact you after that meeting to inform you of the outcome. I really appreciate your time, guys, and I'm glad to be part of Sunnyvale. And even if this doesn't work out, feel free to let me know if there's any other way I can help. I'm more than willing. Thank you very much for that. Thanks, guys. Appreciate Take it. Take care, Franklin. Have a good evening. Take care. Deputy city clerk, are we ready with the next candidate? Mr. Mayor, we're waiting for our next candidate to check in. Okay, so it'll be just a moment. Mr. Mayor, yes. the next candidate, Michael Lerman, has just been promoted to a panelist. Okay. Hello, Michael. Uh, I'm Mayor Larry Klein. Welcome. Uh, let me take a moment to explain the process. You know, each council member will have an opportunity to, to speak and ask you a question. This interview is scheduled for 15 minutes, so please keep that in mind when you're answering those questions. And first up is Council Member Hendricks. Hello, hi, my name is Glenn. Um, thanks for applying of what goes on. 
Um, I see, you know, you, you, in your application, you've got a lot of stuff about what you're doing with hotels, been on the board of directors in the, for the downtown association. So those appear to be kind of really more hands-on kind of roles. How do you see, you know, being able to bring your skills and stuff to a board and commission, which is a little more policy and is not necessarily a, a hands-on group? How, how would you bring success to that? I think you're on mute. Yeah. Rookie mistake. I guess I was making that faster than it needed to be. <laughs> With all the Zoom calls going on, I should know better. Thank you for the question, Glenn, and uh, good to meet you. Uh, I, I think that uh, I read through the playbook, the 2022 playbook, that I think um, really did have a lot of operations details in there. And, and there are, even though a lot of this is around policy and advisory work, there's a lot of nuts and bolts that needs to be done and a lot of collaborating that's the same in a board of directors for downtown association. Uh, it's also understanding what's going on in the community and the impact of the suggestions we're making, uh, being able to see that from the ground level before we, we make, make a suggestion to somebody. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, next up is Council Member Melton. Hey, Mike, it's Russ. Nice to see you again uh, over Zoom this time. Uh, and I appreciate all your um, uh, work in the hotel industry and maybe offline after this meeting, you can give me sort of an economic uh, viewpoint from the hotel industry um, for what goes on. Uh, my question is, I'm glad to hear you mentioned to Council Member Hendricks that you've gone through the 2022 playbook. That's awesome. What leaps out to you uh, most uh, in terms of the next steps in terms of greenhouse gas emission reductions? Did you find a step or an action in there that really leapt out to you as something that we need to grab and execute well on? Thank you. Yeah, yeah great, great question. Thank you, Russ. And um, please let me know how I can connect with you. Also, I'd be happy to, sh to share what, what we're seeing here in the hotel world. I, I, what stood out to me, there's a pie chart somewhere along the way that showed the contribution by each type of, I'll call them a polluter. So it was traffic was 50% of the pie chart followed by two different pie chunks that were part of buildings. Um, I, I expected the contribution to be high from both. Um, I was also kind of surprised that solid waste was such a low contributor, but I guess it's the way that we're diverting so much from the landfill. So I learned a lot from that. Um, that seems incredibly challenging given uh, someone who commutes down the El Camino and through Moffat Park at times and watching what's happening with Stevens Creek and how they're looking at opportunities to divert traffic and get people into some alternative mass transportation. There's pretty neat stuff going on through San Jose and Santa Clara. Um, that looks really complicated. And I think that's where clearly it had the biggest offset. And same with the buildings. There's so much that has been done and is in development now uh, and how much more space is there to really tear down and an appetite for it in Sunnyvale for new development. So retrofitting existing buildings, residential and commercial, seems like an incredible opportunity. Working for developers and managing their properties, I know what a tough nut that can be to crack. So I think there's some really incredible work to be done to take what's already there and, and figure out the steps to bring some of that into fruition. That's where I'd focus. Right on. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Next up is Councilmember Goldman. Uh, all right, hold on. Hi, Mr. Lehrman, thank you very much for applying. Um, that um, pie chart uh, you're talking about, uh, yeah, fascinating. Uh, just a fun fact um, of that 50%, it's called transport, not just cars. So it includes trucks, um, airplanes, everything. And of that, um, 20, only uh, about a uh, um, little over half of that 50% is, is uh, actual cars like you and I drive uh, and the um, and of that um, commuting is actually a small part of it so uh, but let's assume for a moment I, I ask this of everyone I get different answers all the time assume for the moment it's 10 years later 10 years from now all transport is electric Tesla and GM and everything totally electric so what's your next priority what's your what are you going to focus on well I, I think that the and, it, and it's going to sound very amateur coming from uh, the way I'm able to digest it, but focusing on the pollution from the buildings, the, the carbon Im impact from the buildings. And I think that's work that will take a good 10 years to actually come to fruition. Uh, looking at electrifying all the transportation, which I think is awesome. And you may have seen in my application, I drive an electric car and still choose to ride my bike most of the time, 
even without that because I'm often made fun of by diesel truck driving friends of mine that I'm simply pulling off a grid that's dirtier than diesel gasoline. So I've also seen that that um, most of the energy that's being produced in Sunnyvale is uh, clean and, and renewable. So I would normally say, let's focus on the source of electrifying those vehicles, but it sounds like we're in pretty good shape in Sunnyvale. So I would say is, is to focus on the buildings and also to continue to collaborate. I saw some statement about um, how, how a lot of the greenhouse gas may be being produced in other areas to bring resources into Sunnyvale. So I'm commuting from Santa Cruz Mountains. I'm using electricity here to get into Sunnyvale. So trying to impact the, the surrounding communities, I haven't seen the other cities as focused as Sunnyvale has been. And I think that collaborating on the greater peninsula and Bay Area would be really beneficial. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Lerman. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next up is Council Member Fong. Hey, Mike. Good to see you again. Hope you're doing well. Um, just a quick question. You know, the Sustainability Commission just reviewed the, the reach codes, and that's coming to Council in a bit. And I was just curious, uh, since you're on the commercial side, on the hotel side, what do you think about a reach code that does not exempt uh, commercial, because that's a concern for, for many businesses, you know, having electric stoves versus gas stoves to be able to cook, especially Chinese restaurants, I can imagine. You know, what, what do you think about, especially relevant to the hotel industry that has those, those uh, kitchen, kitchen uh, systems? Uh, thank you, and great to see you again as well, Mason. Um, and, and having eaten a bowl of pho that was probably just on a, on a gas stove at some point, I understand how important that is. And I've lived in homes that are both. This was actually a big one for me as I was going through the plan and, and thinking about electrification um, in our business. And we heat these, these incredibly large uh, water boilers. We heat um, washing machine, water, and power dryers. So there's just so much that's connected to gas for us. I think in the long term, it's something we need to cope with. There's a lot of refiguring that needs to be done. So I'm in support. I just, I think the same way that we have Sunnyvale has laid out these steps and benchmarks towards 2050, the same process has to be done. And we have to recognize that that maybe isn't done in 10 years because I don't know that there are commercially available um, laundry installs that can be run on electricity. Uh, so let's look out 10 years. And the same way we're pushing the car industry to, to produce electrified cars at, at mass, same thing's gotta be done for commercial equipment. Great, thank you. Hi, Mike. Uh, so a question about since you're since you're running several hotels, what are you doing regarding food diversion? So meeting, you know, keeping food out of uh, the waste dump at the end of the day. So, thanks, Mary Klein. That's a really good one. And, it, and actually, it starts at home for me where we have four chickens and two little boys. And every scrap of food that's not going into our mouth is going to the chickens. So we focus um, really significantly at home on diverting that. And it also means changing our meal plan. That in the hotel business and in food service for us starts with planning, purchasing the correct amount, storing it correctly so that we don't have this, this first round of waste. Um, we, we're in communities and we operate in several where there are food diversion programs. We 100% participate in those as a next step. And I think that this has to be central to anybody serving food in these communities uh, including working with food banks or other recapturing agencies to get this food into the community. We, we in, in these branded hotels often will serve food items that are maybe a little impractical. They don't have, they don't have homegrown origins. They're often frozen and flown in and they're done in mass. Uh, they don't hold well. I think we've got we've to shift our mentality around these, shift the brands to do a better job, but it, it's also a large part of what's going on here. And I think the organic waste is creating this, this great amount of greenhouse gas also that we can be a part of diverting. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is Vice Mayor Smith. Great, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for applying. I'm glad to see your application come across. I had a couple questions about prioritization of the policy issues. Um, so you seem to hint a little bit or allude to equity issues in terms of uneven impacts of pollution and waste on several different community groups. So I'd like to get your views on that as well as um, 
we are looking, uh, the city is looking at adding housing to Moffat Park uh, and the question of sea level rise and the impact on Moffat Park is coming up. So what's your views on what to do about housing in Moffat Park and with regard to sea level rise, just off spitballing. I don't know if you've thought about it, but. Yeah, I have a little bit. Thanks, Vice Mayor Smith. Um, and, and I think about it because I ride the Bay Trail as well and I walk on there with my kids and I see how close we are to sea level, uh, very literally, because we can, we can step right into the water there and to imagine how flat everything is and the impact of any water coming into Moffat Park is awfully scary. So to your first question about equity, and the impact of, of these policies on people in the community. I, I don't actually know, but I did notice as I read through these that there's goals that require a lot of um, resources. And I was thinking about the impact of even COVID on, on um, city finances, county, state, access to money, and how that's gonna dry up. Then uh, people in lower income areas, uh, their landlords retrofitting, what does that do to their housing um, how many of these things, even if they're homeowners in, in Sunnyvale, how do these requirements impact them as, as we start to, to drive the city forward? Are we able to bring everybody with us and, and understand that? So I don't really know on that regard. And I think that, that bears a question to ask at every step along the path. I believe housing in Moffat Park would be amazing uh, as one of the plays in the playbook of getting housing closer to work. This would be a really important step there. The light rail passing through is nice, but you have to live on the light rail line to take advantage. So if you could have housing in Moffat Park, especially with some density and some great public parks, this would be incredible and great for the hotel business as well. Um, there is the threat of sea level rise that we're all subject to at this point. So making that a, um, a priority hand in hand with building housing is gonna be critical, but also I, I think as I read some of the statistics on, on the temperature rising in the US of just 2.3 degrees Fahrenheit and what that does to everybody, it's a much bigger risk than we can fully impact. So um, maybe considering that developers need to really, really build in some diversion of water if that becomes an issue. So maybe a little over my head, but this is the spitball where my head goes. It's, it's a risk it's a, and it's a gamble and maybe a path we're heading down. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Next up, Council Member Larson. Hi, good to see you. Um, thanks for applying. So I had a, a question about retrofitting uh, to remove natural gas, and you had, had talked a little bit about that. Uh, can you say more about what you see, um, how we might bring that about, some of the challenges we might need to overcome, um, how, how we could help that go far, go faster. Yeah, thanks for asking. I, I think if, if I look at the people that I, I could see now would be to engage the developers that are in the area, both past, present, and future, to ask them, wh where are these? Because you could hear, as I started to rattle off a few of these items that are gas powered, we need to find what to be retrofitted. Um, I think set a target that's out, that is realistic. So if it's 20 years or if it's by 2050, to use the full the full 30, what would it take to get from here to there and simply work back in chunks? If the developers are required to provide electrified buildings, they're going to find a way to get the equipment manufactured correctly, which I also think bears engaging some of these large manufacturers like WSD that we use for our equipment and get both those groups in the room to start to say, how do we actually make this happen? Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Okay, Mike, uh, thank, you, thank you again for applying. A final decision will be made by council on August 25th and the city clerk will contact you after that meeting uh, to inform you the final outcome. So, so thanks for joining us tonight. Sure, thank you for the opportunity. And this was really well run. I appreciate the questions, everyone. Thank you. Have thank you, good evening. Good night. See you. Deputy city clerk, are we ready for our next candidate? Yes, Mr. Mayor, the next candidate Gwyneth Buckley has just been promoted to a panelist. Hello, Gwyneth. Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, I can. So my name is Larry Klein. Uh, I'll take a moment to explain the process. So each council member will have an opportunity to speak and ask you a question. And the interview is scheduled for 15 minutes. So please keep that in mind while you're answering those questions. Uh, first up is Councilmember Melton. 
Hey, hi, Gwen. I'm Russ. It's nice to meet you over Zoom, and thank you for applying. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. You have a, a lot of impressive things in your application, I think, to talk about, and I'm going to just focus on one. Uh, and I'm glad to hear that you're a member of the Silicon Valley Bike Coalition. I'm a member, too, and I think they do a lot of good advocacy work, but there was um, a letter that um, Shiloh Ballard sent to the city council like a couple of months ago. And the premise of the letter was that we should intentionally slow down vehicular traffic for the purpose of encouraging people to do more bicycling. And I, I really struggle with that premise. And I was wondering if you were familiar with that concept, either from the Bike Coalition or from your work in uh, transportation planning at Sam Trans and could share your reaction or thoughts about all of that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I think um, slowing down traffic is a way to mitigate um, mitigate bike and pedestrian collisions. I um, am not familiar with cities that have done it, like implemented it very quickly as a result of the pandemic and the, um, the decrease in vehicular traffic, traffic because of that. Um, but I think like that is a tool in the toolbox of how to um, help mitigate the, the pedestrian and bike collisions that are occurring. Um, and I think it's a better tool for more residential, um, more residential streets um, and ones that can easily, like people might be driving faster on than what this posted speed limit is. So you're not necessarily um, decreasing the actual speed limit. You're just um, using visual cues and like maybe like bulb outs or um, um, paint or things like that to, to decrease the speed of vehicular traffic. Um, and I think that's, it's good for the community in the sense that it, um, well, decreases collisions, but also like really encourages people, especially during this time to feel comfortable out walking about their neighborhood. Um, yeah, and one street that like just comes to mind is I live pretty close to Pastoria. And I think it was like a year or two ago, there was a, um, a pedestrian death that happened. Um, and um, and yeah, it's, it's kind of people tend to speed on it even though it goes through a residential neighborhood. So it's, um, it's a strategy that Pastoria and um, roadways similar to that could benefit from. Got it, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next up, Councilmember Goldman. Thank you, Mayor Klein. Um, thank you, Ms. Buckley, for applying. I always welcome as uh, residents to uh, join. Um, so I've been asking the same question for almost four years now um, for sustainability. Assume all transport has gone electric. You know, the Tesla effect is completely over done. There's electric pickups, there's electric uh, semis. How, what's the next uh, priority? In, for sustainability? In terms of, um, well, I think in terms of transportation, one of the big priorities is that won't necessarily be mitigated just by the electrification of vehicles is getting more people in cars, or not more people in cars, more people in one vehicle. So like um, that could be through like buses or carpooling or um, trains and kind of promoting those types of modes. Um, the high occupancy vehicle modes um, because electrification alone will not solve the congestion problem that has that we've seen well pre-COVID but um, throughout Sunnyvale and throughout the region um, it it could actually like I think even with like um, um, self-driving vehicles it could increase congestion because you have more vehicles some without any people at all and so I think we need to incentivize the use of high occupancy vehicles um, and that can be through numerous different strategies such as um, bus priority on El Camino like I know VTA is doing some work about speeding up their buses and kind of incentivizing that um, as a mode of transportation um, and uh, promoting access to Caltrain in Sunnyvale, um, just to make it safe so people feel like they can easily walk or bike to the train and it becomes more integrated into the way they, they move around the city. Uh, thank you. That's my question. Thank you. Next up is Councilmember Fong. 
Hi, Gwen, and thanks for replying. I uh, hope to be able to meet you in person one day. Um, mm -hmm. Just a quick question. The Sustainability Commission just went over reach codes on Monday. I don't know if you have, had to, happened to see that. And I was just curious about the commercial exemption uh, issues. So, for example, there's a lot of retail kitchens uh, that like a pho restaurant or a ramen restaurant that may use gas stoves. So how do you feel about exempting um, commercial for the reach code or do you support it? Do you not support it? Uh, if so, why? If, if not, why? Um, I actually didn't have the chance to see that the meeting on Monday. Um, but I think in my initial reaction to that is I um, would support the exemption for commercial buildings that have that existing infrastructure in place. Um, but I think there's ways the city can encourage commercial to make that shift to from natural gas to um, to electric um, through other through other means. So um, through uh, just the way buildings are developed and, and that that method. That's my yeah. initial reaction. I'm not as well versed in in that sector. No worries. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Gwen. Uh, and so a question I have, you know, you have uh, an impressive resume, I'll say that. Uh, if you had a magic wand, what would be your number one priority for, from a transportation standpoint, change in Sunnyvale? Yeah, I mean, I think, so I have a background in active transportation and um, right now I'm doing bus planning. And so I think right now, because I'm so immersed in the bus universe, <laughs> um, I would have to, go that route and say, I think just speeding up the buses on El Camino should be a, a big priority for Sunnyvale. And um, um, it, it, it's like, the, it's a very important um, backbone in terms of um, the, the entire bus network in um, Santa Clara County. And then also um, it has access to a number of different like housing, like there's a lot of commercial in El Camino. And um, I, I think as we rethink El Camino Real, there's not only opportunity to speed up buses, but to put in um, bike lanes and bike infrastructure as well, and really make it a, a mode friendly um, thoroughfare, um, a place that people can easily, easily go and hop on their bike or access a bus stop or go to their favorite restaurant and just walk around and feel comfortable and not that they're surrounded by a sea of parking lots. Um, and so to be more specific about some bus priority infrastructure, I think just um, supporting the TSP, which is already implemented, the transit signal priority, which is already implemented on El Camino and um, Q jumps, which are um, a, just a small, like it's, it's infrastructure, but it's a way for the bus to kind of cut the queue um, when traffic is backed up at a light. Um, and yeah, I think supporting the existing ways to support and expand the existing transportation infrastructure is, is really important. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is Vice Mayor Smith. Yeah, thank you, Gwyneth. I appreciate your application and thanks for answering our questions so patiently. I had a question. Uh, one of your comments intrigued me about how to engage with um, local nonprofits and community groups, which is to compensate them for the time that they take to provide um, input on city projects. So um, I was, and then you had some other um, good suggestions about uh, language and other things, I'm assuming like childcare and that kind of thing. but. Um, my question is, how would how would you envision that working um, to compensate um, community groups and so on? And are there any other jurisdictions that are doing anything like that? Yeah, so it's it's complicated to do it because it's something that usually um, hasn't been incorporated into the planning process. Um, like, just it's typically not a part of. Um, of the budget for different plans. Um, but I do know that, I don't know all the details of it, but the city of San Jose, um, they have the, um, the Better Bikeways project um, in their downtown area that they're expanding or they're, 
they're doing something with it right now. Um, but I know that they, like as part of this next step in that project, they um, are compensating Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition for the time they take to provide input and to like reach out to the, the community and get kind of their network involved. Um, and it's something that is, um, at that, like I said, has to be integrated into like the budget for each project. And it can get a little complicated if it's like grant funded. Um, but I think it's something that like, we, we need to recognize um, the community um, and these organizations that put so much time and effort into um, helping support the projects that the cities put forward. And so, and also like they help the cities um, kind of get out and communicate with the public. And so we need to compensate them for that time. And I think even like, this is even more complicated, but for like some community outreach meetings, um, it's, it's just important to like incentivize people to be there. And that can be sometimes through compensation, sometimes through things just as simple as like food and um, childcare, because a lot of times um, it's challenging for people to attend public meetings because they, they have to watch their kids. Um, and I like, I don't know, my brain is like straddling this like COVID and pre-COVID and post-COVID world. <laughs> so it's, um, I don't know what public meetings will look like for like the next year, but I think there's there's just a lot of innovation going on in terms of ways to to really reach out to those typically underrepresented community members and populations, and um, getting their voice heard and making sure their voice is um, incorporated into the planning process. Thank you. Now that you mention it, I believe Silicon Valley Clean Energy offered grants for outreach. Um, so oh, awesome. yeah, so I'm, I, thanks for helping me understand your suggestion. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Next up is Councilmember Larson. Great, thank you. Uh, nice to meet you, Gwen, over Zoom and thanks for applying. Mm -hmm. um, and great answers to a lot of the questions so far. Um, I'm interested in um, how your work on the Grand Boulevard Initiative um, kind of informs your thoughts on El Camino. And you've already given us some answers about transportation there, um, but uh, there are other parts to that as well. And Sunnyvale is updating our El Camino specific plan right now. Um, so mm -hmm. it's a great time for providing input. So what are your thoughts on what else we can do on El Camino? Yeah. Um... So I, the, the purpose, Grand Boulevard doesn't necessarily like tell what exactly cities should be doing on El Camino. It's more just like providing um, a, a forum for cities to share um, resources and to kind of get to get people together to talk. Um, but I think in terms of El Camino and Sunnyvale, I mean, um, transportation of course is a huge piece, but I think housing too. Um, and having having nodes along, I think that's from what I recall about the Sunnyvale El Camino, um, I think it's the specific plan. Um, yeah, having like nodes of housing and really um, just making it a destination, not just a place people pass through. And there's, I mean, increasing housing, but also there's a lot of simple um, or like small scale things to do around that, such as the like having inviting inviting frontage, frontages to the retail and to the housing and um, um, increasing the, the, the um, network of streets so it's easier for people to move around and interact with the, the different retail options and um, uh, limiting parking just as a, not from the transportation perspective, but also from like, the visual and um, the, the perspective of people that are just traveling along El Camino. And um, we, you want it to be less of a, a car centric place and more of a people centric place. Um, and yeah, there, I mean, there's an, a number of different tactics, but, and also I think it's important to collaborate closely with the, the two bordering cities. So Santa Clara and Mountain View um, of course, like Sunnyvale is unique, but it, this is a common, um, a common roadway and just finding ways to kind of bridge 
bridge the transition to the different cities and creating a similar feel and like using some of their, their best practices and stuff. Cause I know Mountain View is, um, I think they approved bike lanes on El Camino. Um, and, and yeah, so I think that's, that's one opportunity, um, <laughs> which was really exciting. Um, Great. Yeah. And thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And next up is Councilmember Hendricks. Yeah, hello. Hi, um, I'm Glenn. Thanks for applying for what's going on. I also sit on the VTA board, so I have a great appreciation for the work of what you do in public transportation. So thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody has uh, already asked and you've answered my question, so I don't have anything else. But thank you for applying. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So Glenn, uh, thank you very much for your interest in your application. Uh, a final decision will be made by City Council on August 25th. And then the city clerk will contact you after that meeting to give you the final results. You don't need to be present to win, of course. Okay. So, <laughs> so thank you very much. Have a great evening. Yeah, thank you guys for taking the time to interview me. Appreciate it. Thanks. Nice seeing you Bye. all. Bye. Bye, take care. And so with that uh, council, we will be taking a 13 minute recess and return back here at 6.15. See you then.
Deputy City Clerk, are we ready? Hello, Mr. Mayor, we are waiting for our next candidate to check in. Okay. Let's go ahead and reconvene the special council meeting in the meantime, and we'll wait for our next candidate. Um, Mr. Mayor, while we're waiting, just uh, who's the next person going to be? Because I know there were some changes in the schedule and I don't oh, have it right in front of me. Yes. Okay. So so the next group of people in the order is Benjamin Heilick, followed by Tanya Veitch, followed by Agnes Beith, Beith. That's it. So it says three. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Mayor, the next candidate, Benjamin Hylek, has been promoted to panelist. Okay. Welcome, Benjamin. Hi, I'm Larry Klein, mayor for the city. Let me take a moment to explain the process. Uh, each council member will have an opportunity to speak and ask you a question. This interview is scheduled for 15 minutes, so keep that in mind as you're answering those questions. And with that, first up is council member Goldman. Uh, hi, Ben. Uh, thank you for signing up for this. Uh, according to this, you're looking for housing and human services. Uh, so, uh, what um, there's a, a lot of talk about building more housing, um, and uh, other people say, well, you know, traffic uh, roads can only hold so much traffic. So, oh, what's um, what's the best way to approach housing in, in this case? Uh, uh, I mean. Uh, sorry, I think there's feedback. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll put my up. No worries, no worries. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I think it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a broad question, but I'll try to take it. Um, so, I mean, as far as traffic goes, um, I mean, there's a lot of solutions to traffic in particular. There's, as like, and then it's, again, just in the realm of traffic, there's this idea of induced demand, right? So, um, you know, if you just like continue to build more highway infrastructure, um, if you kind of are on the assumption that everything should be approachable by cars rather than trying to build a, a city center that's that's really centered around walking, um, you're kind of setting yourself up for failure in, in that sense. So I think kind of the solution is not necessarily don't build as much housing, but try to make uh, that new development centered around walking and, and also, you know, increase kind of transit options in that case. So. Okay. Uh I guess. Uh, thank you very much. Is that a good enough answer? I'm sorry. No, I mean, like. Um, no, I mean, I, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. Uh, next up is Councilmember Fong. Hi, Ben, and thanks for applying. Um, yeah, I first. saw on your uh, questionnaire that you just recently moved to Sunnyvale, so you haven't been able to attend a housing meeting, and, and actually they haven't met in a while. But I was wondering, have you had a chance to go through the website and look at the past housing commission agendas and, and or, or yeah. even watch a meeting? And, and if so, what what's one takeaway you had from one of the meetings? Yeah, so I did um, go through the minutes for like uh, past, I think it was like a year or two back at this point. Um, so um, I noticed that there were like a couple of people that never showed up. That was like one of my takeaways. Um, but um, yeah, I, I didn't find a video though. Um, so I'm not sure, um, but uh, yeah, um, I, I don't. I don't have any like uh, really specific takeaways. Um, like the, the 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 minutes in a lot of cases seemed a little light. Um, Is there yeah. a topic that you saw that perhaps that stood out to you? Uh, no, I can't recall anything. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Ben, let let me ask you just a quick question as far as uh, as far as housing, and you talked a little bit about 
below market rate programs and just uh, your, I, I'd like you to go into a little bit more detail as far as your vision, as far as uh, how that can help uh, first time buyers as well as you know, other programs of similar uh, of a similar type that you might like to see in the city. Yeah, um, so I think a lot of that's actually super relevant now. So um, I, one of the reasons why I applied for this commission is just kind of looking at the effects of COVID-19 on people's like, you know, obviously we have like the eviction more starting right now, but what does that actually mean in, in one year? Like what, what are people's financial situations? So, you know, it's probably gonna have a huge impact on credit scores, like um, just even, you know, uh, impact on people's ability or even desire to, to buy a home. Um, so I think that those kind of programs can really incentivize, like, you know, when people are buying a home, they're, they're kind of making a commitment to the community, which is really nice, as opposed to um, when someone's renting, it's often, often a lot more of a temporary relationship. Um, so yeah, I, I think that like those kind of programs are gonna become increasingly important. Um, I think they're like one of the many ways that are, one of the many tools that can be used to kind of avert this, um, the, the, the potential crisis that, that could happen from our current financial situation. Um, but uh, I guess in the future, specifically related to COVID-19, I've been trying to think a lot of, you know, what kind of policies can be can be implemented there. I think that um, I kind of mentioned it, but like specific, specifically the um, down payment, trying to, to, a couple of things. One, a lot of people are gonna have terrible credit scores um, so trying to make it easier for people with those bad credit scores to still uh, secure housing. Um, also, a lot of people aren't going to be able to pay um, uh, down payments, which especially around here can be super sizable. Um, so yeah, so th those are some of the specific things I think on the um, on the housing front. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up is Vice Mayor Smith. Yeah, thank you for applying. Nice to meet you. I'm Nancy Smith. I. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. I see you're interested also in the library board of trustees and um, you um, seem to um, want to rethink what libraries mean. So do you have any thoughts to share about uh, where you see libraries going in the future? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think part of this actually is also coming around from from the perspective of, of COVID-19 as well. Um, I feel like I keep bringing everything back to it. Um, but I, I think when I, thinking about even a housing front and, and how kids' educations are being impacted right now by the fact that like, you know, everyone's crammed inside. A lot of kids, especially lower income kids already don't have dedicated spaces to study. And now they're like being asked, like shoved into a closet with like five of their siblings all doing different courses and whatnot. Um, so I think that, that there's actually a huge opportunity in libraries being a, being a place um, just in general that, that kids can, um, especially like, like kid, people that are coming from more affluent families, they have room in their house to just kind of have this dedicated study, study center. Um, so that, that, that's one way. I think another thing is like um, my background it, as it relates to education is more from a, from a maker movement side of things where I've been really involved with like just the make movement in general and, and, and giving talks to like education conferences um, related to making, because that, that's how I grew up um, was like making robots and stuff like that. Um, and so I think that that kind of access to like hands-on education is what's becoming, especially in this like digital age where like things like, you know, books are, are so easy to, to transmit over the internet in some way. Um, but that kind of hands-on experience is becoming increasingly hard to get, especially for lower income kids. Great, thank you. Thank you. Next up is Councilmember Larson. Hi, Ben. I'm Gustav. Nice to meet you over Zoom, and thank you for applying. Um, so my question is back on the Housing and Human Services Commission, and one of the uh, main responsibilities for that commission is to make recommendations on how to allocate funding to our nonprofit partners in the community. Every year, the federal government gives the city a, a pool of money. Um, and we always have more nonprofits applying than we have dollars to hand out. So we have to make priority decisions. How would you go about prioritizing uh, which nonprofit services would get funding? Yeah, I think this is an awesome question. So this is something that's come up a lot when I was working in, in Worcester as well. Um, I think you can't prioritize or even try to prioritize without having the right data. And I think that a lot of cities, at least the city that I was working with uh, in, in Worcester, didn't have the right data. 
So you end up with even a lot of waste in between nonprofits because they don't actually understand which, which specific geographic areas of a city needs funding or even what specific services are needed. Um, so I think that that's huge. And it also saves them money in the sense where it makes it easier, where if you actually, so it's kind of bi-directional where when you have that data of who needs help, number one, you know, kind of in a meta sense who actually needs that, like what are the areas that should receive the most funding? But then also you already know those people that need the funding. So it makes it easier to connect them with nonprofits. Um, so that's one thing. I think that in like in the immediate sense, as far as like opportunities, um, like, like near-term opportunities, I think that um, it, it remains to be seen, I guess, what impact this has on, on the housing market and whether or not we see, um, like whether or not uh, housing, housing prices will um, decline. If that's the case, I think that uh, it's a good time for nonprofits to, uh, it, it, would be a, it would be a good time to try to fund nonprofits in acquiring affordable housing and providing affordable housing. Um, uh, yeah, it, it would be a good opportunity for that. And, and if I wanted to pull that slide by. Great, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thanks, next up, Councilmember Hendricks. Hello, uh, my name's Glenn. Thank you very much for applying and I don't have any additional questions to ask, but thank you for applying. Thanks. Thanks, and Council Member Melton. Hey Ben, I'm Russ. Nice to meet you over Zoom and thank you for applying. Hey, I wanted to um, swing around to question six from the application, Ben. Um, it talks about how um, uh, one of the roles of boards and commissions is to provide advice, whereas city council is the final stop for policy. And it looks like you took a pass on the question. I, I understand the potential for vagueness and difficulty in answering. Um, but Council Member Larson's question was a good one in that the job of a commission isn't to set policy, but rather to provide advice. And I wanted to give you another chance at taking a shot at that question, Ben, maybe with a deeper understanding. What do you think now? Absolutely, yeah. I think, I think my, my problems with the question was just that uh, a lot of it just goes back to, to basic um, uh, uh, skills that you would pick up uh, working with, in a, especially a cross-functional company. Um, so like it, Apple specifically is a really, uh, like I said, functional company where it's broken up into functional organizations. Um, so in order to, it kind of means that you're responsible for a lot of things you're not actually in control of. Um, and that kind of comes back to the idea of influence and trying to make a case that's as convincing as possible and trying to have influence over an outcome, but you don't ultimately have control over that outcome. Um, so yeah, so I'm sorry for my kind of a uh, brief answer there, uh, but uh, all good, thank you. Okay, uh, Ben, thank you very much for your application and your interest in joining the process tonight. A final decision will be made by city council on August 25th and the city clerk will then uh, contact you later that week uh, as far as what the final results were. So you don't need to be present to win, you don't need to attend that meeting, but thank you for applying and thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you so much for your guys' time. Great. Have a good evening. You too. Deputy City Clerk, are we ready with our next candidate? Yes, Mr. Mayor. The next candidate, Tanya Veitch, has just been promoted to panelist. Hello, Tanya. Uh, my name's Larry Klein. I'm mayor for Sunnyvale. And let me just take a moment to explain the process. You know, each council member will have an opportunity to ask you a question. The interview is scheduled to last for 15 minutes, so please keep that in mind when you're answering the questions. Uh, and so first up is Council Member Fong. Hi, Tanya, and thanks for applying, uh, and thanks for all your service uh, that you reiterated in your application on safe routes and, and things like that. Really great to see that. Um, we actually, I don't know if you had a chance, but on Monday, the Sustainability Commission uh, looked through the proposed REACH codes, which is the switch to all electric, and one of the items up for consideration is the commercial exemption. So for example, you may have a restaurant uh, that needs a gas stove in, or a flame in order to cook. So uh, certain cities have this as permitted, certain cities don't have this as permitted, meaning that they either require it or, or a conversion or not. So just curious on your thoughts, you know, should commercial uh, uh, uses be converted to all electric or should they you provide an exemption. Hi, Councilmember Fong. Just want to confirm you guys can hear me? Yes. 
Okay, thank you. Um, great question. And thankfully, I joined the Sustainability Commission meeting on Monday. So I feel um, prepared to speak to this a little bit as well as part of my work with the County of Santa Clara Office of Sustainability. I do um, assist the cities and jurisdictions with reach codes within the county. So um, this is a good topic. I'm not no expert, especially when it comes to the construction side. But what I do say and that what I heard from the commission members is that they would like to be as progressive and forward thinking as possible and to minimize the number of exemptions. So to where someone would have to apply for a justification to where that is the new standard, especially since it is coming from uh, new construction, how I understand this policy would be. So that doesn't apply to necessarily any of the existing buildings, but it would apply to new policy. So I would stand with the commissioners on that one and say like, let's try to be as bold and forward thinking as possible. Um, I do acknowledge, especially being a staff person at the County of Santa Clara, that, you know, justifications would require additional staff time. So there is that balance. Um, but I know as Sunnyvale being as forward thinking and progressive that we are within the commitment to sustainability, I would say that um, let's go with uh, no, ex like have it to be where folks would have to apply for a justification. Hey, thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Uh, Tanya, so I have a quick question. So you have a, a great resume and, and a, a definite background that would be applicable from a sustainability standpoint. Uh, from a transportation standpoint, what, is, what do you think is your highest, what's the highest priority of, of change if you had a magic wand to, to change something within the city of Sunnyvale? That's a great question. And transportation has been a passion area of mine, especially coming from the public health department and the safe routes to school world. Um, if I could wave a magic wand, I would say let's create safe streets for all. For far too long, we have been um, committing funds and resources to really um, helping cars, right, and drivers. We've been focusing efforts on the drivers and cars, but not as many resources going to pedestrians and bicyclists. So I would say let's create safe streets for all. So that's for streets where from eight to 80 years old, um, especially in the times of COVID that we're in, we aren't seeing as many people driving. Hopefully that can be one of the silver linings of COVID, but we're seeing so many people walking and biking, maybe not today because of the wildfires, but if we have to continue to maintain that social distance, um, we need to be able to provide places for people to be able to walk and bike safely. Um, so I would say like, let's do safe routes, safe streets for all, not just safe routes to school, but safe routes for all. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, next up is Vice Mayor Smith. Hi, Tanya. Nice to see you again. And putting that uh, recent graduation from Leadership Sunnyvale to good use. So that's awesome. Um, I was really struck by your answer to number eight about um, your current or last occupation, and you worked on the sustainability master plan to foster interdepartmental coordination across the county organization, county organization and region. So, um, what lessons did you learn? What advice do you have for Sunnyvale about breaking down the silos that maybe impede progress towards sustainability? What it, what's your takeaways? You guys did your homework, so I appreciate that. Um, what One thing I will say is that we are still currently in development of our sustainability master plan. So this will be going to the board in fall 2020 fingers crossed. Um, so we're still in the process, but what has happened in county being a large organization with 22,000 plus employees across almost 40 departments, we have had to work with almost all of these departments and getting together the sustainability master plan because we know um, sustainability is not just environment, it's also the economy and it's also social equity. So all of these departments, they didn't necessarily at first know how their department fit 
into the sustainability master plan. Why are you inviting me? Why are you having me come to these meetings? So we really had to do one-on-one -on -one meetings with these departments to let them know that their department plays a part in sustainability in, in the sustainability master plan. And part of our goal is that we want every employee of those 22,000 employees to be educated, engaged, so that they feel that they are uh, actually a sustainability um, practitioner. So that way we're gonna have to do a lot of education with those employees. We're gonna have to put modules and webinars in place to be able to do that. But I think the biggest thing was the buy-in from the departments. And we had to go in there, do one-on-one -on -one meetings and ask them, you know, where does sustainability fit within your department? Sometimes they said, you know, for example, what was the department? Um, I can't think of, I don't want to put, I shouldn't put someone under the bus anyways, but one of the departments was like, we, ha we have no idea how we fit into sustainability. So we just asked and had those conversations and said, well, what are the things that you do? And we made those connections for those departments. And then we're telling them that we're able to tell your sustainability story. A lot of the things that our departments were doing were sustainability related and they had no idea. But what we're telling them is that we're going to help to share your department's sustainability story as part of this larger sustainability effort within the county. So I would say that it is very important to have um, meetings with the departments, hear their concerns, understand their frustrations, but then also make the connections to how it can apply to their work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Councilmember Larson. Hi, I'm Gustav. It's nice to see you. Um, so my question is, um, Sunnyvale is updating a number of specific plans right now. Moffat Park, El Camino, Lawrence Station. Could you maybe just pick one of those and tell us uh, some things you think we ought to be considering uh, to further sustainability in, in that area? Great question. You said Moffat Park, Lawrence Station, and you mentioned one other? And El Camino. And El Camino. Um, one thing, I'll, I'll pick El Camino. Um, as we know, there's been a lot of um, contention issues, especially reducing speed on El Camino, as well as creating bike lanes, um, especially, you know, how it relates to our auto industry, especially on El Camino. So I would say that we want to be able to build density, have commercial spaces that are mixed uses um, as part of this plan, but then also, again, really putting people in the center of these plans. Who are the people who are going to be living there? What, um, how are we going to build places for these people? Um, what are their access to transportation? What's their access to be able to walk to a park or to the grocery store? Really putting people-centric planning in the front when we're developing these um, site-specific plans. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Councilmember Hendricks. Yeah, hello. Um, this is Glenn. Um, thank you for applying. Thank you for um, taking the CERT training. Thank you for taking Leadership Sunnyvale. There are several graduates that are here on the council. And I'm just kind of curious if you could share with us, because I kind of want to know what Leadership Sunnyvale is doing. What did they teach you about how our boards and commissions interact and support the council? Great question. Well, I think one of the awesome things about Leadership Sunnyvale and takeaways that I learned is that there are so many committed people from council and staff and community partners in Sunnyvale. So we're very fortunate to have great community partners. I would also add that, um, you know, what I learned is that someone can be a leader. So someone, you know, who, um, if it's the mom who has a child within the school, or it's someone like me who just wants to be able to share some of the experiences that I have learned and be able to apply this as part of the city. I learned that, you know, we need leaders. We need, I think, especially leaders are there reflective of our community as well. I think that's one of the biggest takeaways that I learned is that we want our leaders to be reflective of the community, have voices of the community, um, look like the community, um, even having the, um, you know, gender differences where we only have one woman city council person, you know, increasing that racial as well as gender diversity within our community. Um, 
But I learned as part of leadership Sunnyvale is that how to engage with council as well as your commissioners. Um, it's from my experience, all of you as well as the commission have be been very um, open to whether it's feedback, conversations, and having email exchanges. And so letting folks know that you are accessible, um, you know, that you are out there supporting. I know Larry, uh, uh, Mayor Klein, you're going and supporting businesses. You're one with the people. So letting us know that we can can be leaders, that we need future leaders, and that um, we can work within the city of Sunnyvale. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up is Councilmember Melton. Hey, Tanya, I'm Russ. It's nice to meet you over Zoom, and thank you for applying to serve on a board of commission, and i really impressed with your credentials that you outlined on your application. Um, one of which was safe routes to schools. And it looks like you have a lot of depth and breadth and experience all the way through various um, transitions and implementations. What do you think about safe routes to school in Sunnyvale, sort of where we're ending up, active transportation plan? Do you think it's going in the right direction or have any suggestions? Thank you. Thanks for that question. You bring up a very um, soft spot in my heart, especially because I was working as like one of really the first sustainability coordinators for the Sydney Sunnyvale that was really put on by the County of Santa Clara Public Health. So I was able to work across our four school districts from elementary to high school. Um, and one of the proudest moments that I have is then when our public health funding was really coming to an end. A part of my charge was that to create sustainability for the Safe Routes to School program. And part of that effort and partnership was that we have Norma O'Connell who, O'Connell, who is the Safe Routes to School coordinator and the city of Sunnyvale has dedicated those funds to make sure that there is a coordinator in place to be able to work with all those school districts, to be able to hear out the parents' concerns, um, to listen to the students, to figure out where are the safest places to walk and bike. And I think one of the ex most exciting things is listening into one of the um, recent commission meetings is that there was a presentation from the Department of Transportation staff on the active transportation plan, which also included a safe routes to school plan. I was so excited to see that because a couple years ago, I could have only dreamed of that. So I feel like although there might be places where we can continue to improve and strive for more, I think we're having great, we're making great improvements now. Um, I had a team. So Norma, who is, you know, the Safe Routes to School coordinator, um, you know, it, it takes a village. So it takes the working with the school districts. Um, I think what one thing I would just continue to say is to support from the city, a Safe Routes to School program, make sure that it is funded, um, work collectively with the school district so that way we can figure um, work together and not be divided and having that coordinator to be able to be there to work amongst all four jurisdictions um, is really crucial so one thank you for continuing to fund it um, but I look forward to future things um, I know I was also excited to hear that there's um, walk audits, walk and bike audits happening at the schools, which we know have to get done on an annual basis to figure out where are those places where we need to add stop signs and crosswalks. Um, so I would say we need to continue to do that. And then also if possible, make sure that there's continuing leadership at each school where there's a hopefully a PTA or um, a funded position that could support Safe Routes to School at each, each other's schools. Thank you. That's awesome, Tanya. Thank you very much. And finally, uh, Council Member Goldman. Saving the best for the last. Thank you, Mayor Klein. Uh, hi, Tanya, uh, Michael, uh, nice to meet you. And thank you for applying. Uh, quite impressive uh, how much work you put into the application. Uh, I have one question I ask everyone. Um, assume that, uh, and have been for almost four years, uh, assume that all transport is electric, buses, trucks, uh, everything. Uh, and uh, so, so what's next, basically? Uh, what, um, what would be the next focus? Because I, it looks to me, I've been saying this for years, but it looks like it's getting pretty obvious to everyone that, yeah, we will have an intelligent smart cars that avoid pedestrians and bicyclists and uh, drive on electrons. So what's next? Mm. That's a really good question. Um, what I was even thinking is what, what's next for Sunnyvale where we were able to join Silicon Valley clean energy and have clean energy coming. I think trans some 
improvements in transportation need to happen because we know that is where majority of our greenhouse gas emissions fall. Um, what I'm trying to think of, what is that SVCE for electricity to transportation? I still don't know exactly what the answer might be, but I'm trying to find that so, like that golden nugget. But I do think that um, as we electrify transportation, as transportation probably becomes autonomous, again, we have the opportunity to really look at our roads and see how are they being used and how, again, can we put people in the center of our planning as we know that transportation is going to continue to shift. Um, in light of the current pandemic, I do know that transportation is is taking a big hit especially active or especially you know transportation for Caltrain and others um, so we're gonna have a lot of work to do to make sure that we can continue to su sustain public transportation okay. uh, thank you I'm done okay uh, Tanya thank you for applying thank you for your interest uh, final decision will be made by City Council on August 25th and then the city clerk will contact you after that meeting to inform you the final outcome. So thanks for joining us and thanks for applying. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I ha somehow managed to finish within 15 minutes. So thank you so much for your great questions and I look forward to your decision. Have a good evening. You too, take care. Thank you. Deputy City Clerk, are we ready with our final candidate? Mr. Mayor, we're waiting for our next candidate to join. Okay. Mr. Mayor, the next candidate, Agnes Bike, has been promoted to panelist. Okay. Hello, Agnes. Uh, I'm Larry Klein, Mayor for the City. Um, of course, I'll, I'll take a moment to explain the process. Each council member will have an opportunity to ask you a question. Uh, this interview is scheduled for 15 minutes, so please keep that in mind when you're answering these questions. And so uh, with that, we'll start, and I get to answer, ask the first questions. Um, from your application, uh, you asked, you talked about a healthier city and that, that encompassed several things. And I just like to hear you explain 
from a climate action playbook standpoint, how you hope to have a healthier city? Well, I think today is a really good example of an unhealthy city. <laughs> and so <laughs> I think anything that we can do to mitigate the uh, type of pollution that we see now would be a healthier city. But I also think that um, sea level rise in it is an issue. I think that we do need to have people want to live here because they can walk freely, they can bike freely. So I think all of that makes our city healthy. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next up is Vice Mayor Smith. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Agnes, for applying for the Sustainability Commission. The mayor took my first question, so oh. I'll <laughs> back up question. Okay. <laughs> Which is, um, I see that you have um, a leadership ability, a quality of rallying people around new ideas. So if you could maybe expound on some examples of when you did that and say, you know, if you could apply that to the healthy community idea, that would be great. So um, before I retired from Stanford, I was asked to chair a committee and the committee was supposed to provide an understanding of our leadership and what our leadership was on a personal level. And some people thought that that was not possible, that we just could not get people to really talk about who they were. So I sat down with our leaders. I told them what I thought the issues were and why they had to actually really be who they were. So we structured it so that there were questions that were, were quite personal that they were comfortable with. And then I brought in other people to help put that committee together and help schedule all the meetings. Another thing that I did was many, many years ago, I put together a portal so that people that worked in a high tech company with me could be able to go to one place to find all of the departments that they were looking for and all of the contact information. And that was probably done in maybe a month, which nobody said it could be done at all, let alone that quickly. But I think I just presented the idea clearly and the merits of the idea and how easy it would be to do it. So I, that's it, I think. I think I'm enthusiastic. I don't know if I'm, I'm a little hot and tired right now, so I may not be as enthusiastic sounding as I always am, but I think my enthusiasm can be catchy. Thank you. Uh, next up is Councilmember Larson. Hi, Agnes, it's Gustav. Thanks for being here. And uh, I certainly understand about uh, the heat and the discomfort <laughs> and all that right now. Um, right there with you. Yeah. So Sunnyvale is updating a number of our specific plans right now. So around uh, for Moffat Park, around mm -hmm. the Lawrence Caltrain station, and also along El Camino. Mm -hmm. Could you pick maybe one of those and just share your thoughts on uh, what we might be able to do in one of those areas to uh, make the city more sustainable, um, make it a healthier city? I think Moffat Park comes to mind first because of the discussions that um, I was listening to in regard to sea level rise and environmental related issues. I would like to see, and then the cleanup with Moffat. I think this, this happened, I think during maybe one of the most recent council meetings. And I think what I would like to see is I would like to see us keep the environment as healthy and as clean as possible and have as much open space as possible in Moffat Park. I know that there are businesses there currently. Um, I too am concerned with where we're planning on putting residences and is that really going to be safe for the people that purchase the homes? Um, but I always looked at Moffat Park as being a, a really nice open space that we could all go to. Great, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Great, next up is Council Member Hendricks. Yeah, hello, this is Glenn. Um, first off, thank you for your service already to the city and thanks for applying. Um, and my question kind of goes to that is, what is the reason that you wanna leave the um, Arts Commission? And if we choose not to put you on to sustainability, would you still stay on the Arts Commission? Well, maybe I didn't do my homework because I didn't realize I could not be on two committees at one time. 
So that could be a problem. I've already committed to the Arts Commission. I would not want to step out of that commitment because commitments are quite important to me. Um, I would do what I could if I can't be on two committees at the same time to help the Sustainability Commission in whatever way I could as a private citizen. I've responded to the survey that was sent out. I was pleased to see that they partnered with the Planning Commission. I had a conversation with Bruce to learn more about the commission and was quite um, pleased to see how the commissioners related to each other and how thoughtful they were in their responses and questions, as well as the staff that preside, prevented the, or I should say presented the information. But if I can't be on two, I, I would feel uncomfortable leaving before my term ends. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Next up, Councilmember Melton. Hi, Agnes. It's Russ. Nice to see you. Hi, nice to see you as well. Wonderful. And Council Member Hendricks went in exactly the direction I was going. Oh. Um, we'll, we'll let staff provide you the official answer, but I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, with very limited exceptions, you cannot be on two commissions at the same time. Oh. I, I, I have the pleasure of being the council liaison to the Arts Commission, Agnes, mm -hmm. and you guys are doing some heavy lifting for mm -hmm. the city on public art projects and the arts master plan. Um, and I'm glad to hear you express that you would be comfortable um, plowing forward, doing your best on the arts commission. That's great to hear. Thank you, Agnes. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, next up is Councilmember Goldman. Hi, Agnes. Uh, thank you for applying uh, and for your service on arts. Um, sounds like um, we won't get a um, opportunity to vote for you but anyway <laughs> doesn't have, seem like it does it <laughs> yeah uh, that's too bad because i really i really uh think you're a good very strong applicant uh you're one of the uh you know, in all the years we've been doing this you're one of the few that's really um looked at the commissions and talked to people so thank you very much mm -hmm. uh so but i do have one standard question I might as well get it out there uh let's assume that uh sometime in the near future all cars are and all transport is electric and uh, you know, able to detect and avoid pedestrians and bicyclists. So what's next? What's next in the uh, sustainability agenda? Well, I think sea level rise is the next issue that we will be faced with in um, hopefully not too soon, but it will happen soon. So I think that's something we need to concern ourselves with. And then I think also water will be an issue as well. I mean, we all know we live in a drought ridden state. The droughts are getting longer in duration and shorter in between. And so I think those are two things that we would definitely have to look at. Um, well, thank you. And I, I, I wish I could really wish I could vote for you for- uh, <laughs> Well, wait, for, if you guys really want me, you can't make an exception of one person on two, huh? <laughs> well, there's, there's like five people applying. Uh, for, oh, well then no. <laughs> yeah, I mean- no, Other people uh, need their voice, yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, when when you're done with the arts, please try something else. Thank you. And I do apologize for wasting all of your time. I didn't read anything anywhere that said that I could not be on two commissions at the same time. So my apologies for wasting your time. Well, it wasn't a waste. We got to meet you, and that's uh, and you're a very nice person and a wonderful resident of Sunnyvale. So th that's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. And you're next welcome. up is Councilmember Fong. Hi, Agnes. I'll make it really quick. When When is your term up on uh, ar arts? Is it your second term that you're in right now? This is my first term, Mason. First term. Yeah, my okay, first so, term. So I have I have a bit to go yet. Yeah, yeah so at, at, at that point, you want to reapply. There's an opening on sustainability. That would be great. Um, and I will email our city clerk and, and our city manager about the website issue. Hopefully, that's, that, you know, we can fix that. So yeah. we can prevent this in the future. But thank you so much for applying. And I'm looking forward to the arts master plan coming to council eventually. Yes, it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to it as well. OK, thank that's you on. all. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's not a problem, Agnes. You know, thank you for your interest in, and, you know, trying to give back to the city. I really appreciate that. And, and all the council members, it's not wasting our time. It's great to talk to our residents who are interested and, and want to really give back to the community. So thank you for that. 
uh, we'll, we will be making our decisions on August 25th, but it sounds like your name might actually be pulled by then. So yeah, anyway, probably. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much and, and have a good evening. Thank you for your time. Take care. Good night. Good night. So that was our last candidate for the evening. We'll now move on to adjournment. This meeting is adjourned at 6.59. I want to thank everyone for their participation. Have a good evening. Good night. Thank you. Good night.